on our on our panel. All right, excellent. So we have we are live, ladies and gentlemen. We apologize for um, this technical uh, difficulty that we've had. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's our first time that we're doing the Business Book Club live events, and thank you to COVID nineteen. Um, you know, we've actually um, been forced uh, in, a, in, a, in a very opportunistic way to go online with the Business Book Club. Um, but welcome. Um, before I share with you too much about the Business Book Club, I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's event. We've got an amazing author, Norman Moyer, with us tonight, uh, who's spending his precious time with us uh, and, and our community at the Business Book Club. Uh, but before we go to Norman, I would like to welcome you all and just share with you a little bit about what the Business Book Club is, is, is about. Now, we started the Business Book Club in April, 2017. Um, the idea transformed as I've always been very privileged in, in the sense that I had a mother who took me to a library. And because of going to the library on a regular basis every week, you're still in those days where where you had a little library card and you, you, you took that out and it got stamped and you took the book back and you got your card back and you take out another book. And through that, I've been very fortunate in the way that um, I've learned the discipline of reading and I've learned the, and, and through the discipline of reading, I've experienced the, the privilege of knowledge. And through the privilege of knowledge, I know that you can change lives. Um, because the reality is we're only, we, 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 we only have um, about 20% new thoughts every day. In other words, 80% of our thoughts um, that we have in our mind actually comes from yesterday and, and, and the day before that. So generating new ideas is a very important part of creating the life that you want. Um, and through reading, you are able to do that. And you're able to lift your thinking and know what is possible. And once you've been exposed to that, it changes your life. And there are many, uh, many um, stories like that. And, you know, we can just take the recent example of the Kenyan athlete who ran the marathon in under two, two hours. I mean, what an amazing feat. And nobody thought it was possible, but he's done it. And now that he's done it, um, he has shifted our thinking of what is possible and what we can do. And, and, and that's the gift of knowledge. So because otherwise we, we don't know what we don't know. And through the Business Book Club, our purpose is to share knowledge. Our purpose is to share knowledge with you, our audience, our community, and also through donating books. Now, in our live events, we would normally be, have a... Um, a, a donation box and people would pay it forward by attending our events they would they would donate a book and those books we then distribute to libraries and less privileged communities and up to date we have been able to collect more than six thousand books um, for distribution to libraries and less privileged communities because we're an online event you can obviously not give us a book at the moment and hence why we've changed our model to accept donations uh, and those donations are then will then be used to collect uh, to buy books so that we can distribute that and share knowledge because that really is what the business book club is about is about sharing knowledge to you the audience but also then to communities in, in lesser privileged um, areas all right so before i go ahead and have start my conversation with our esteemed author tonight um please feel free to ask questions. Um, what you can do is uh, you are all on the YouTube channel and ask your question. Um, once you ask the question, we'll get it through on our side. We've got a panelist here and we will then engage with you um, and reflect on those questions and have a conversation about it. And I, you know, I will pose them then to Norman and we'll see what, 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 what Norman has to say. All right, so without any further ado, Norman Moyo, welcome to the Business Book Club and welcome to our first online event. 
Um, you know, usually there's a, there's a, there's a crowd and we give a, a round of applause. So I'm just going to say welcome, more. <laughs> Norman, welcome to our event. And, and, and thank you for spending your precious time to sharing with us uh, your insights. And Norman, you wrote the book, Rumble in the Jungle. Now, now when, I, when, I, when I look at that title, I almost go and I think, but there's, um, it, sound, it, sound, it sounds like a boxing theme. <laughs> you know, rumble in the jungle. Um, but your book isn't, isn't about boxing. Your book is, 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 is about African leadership. But Norman, first, a little bit about you before we, before we talk about, about your book. Um, you are currently the group CEO of, of Econet Energy. Um, but, but, but more importantly, it's, it's your track history. Um, over the past 15 years, you've been with Standard Bank Chartered in Zimbabwe. Uh, you've been in the hospitality industry uh, in South Africa and Botswana, and then very much so in the telecoms industry in Zimbabwe, Zambia, Nigeria, Baran, and Tanzania. So, you know, from an African perspective, you've you've really um, been around. And you know, I don't want to ask you your age at this stage, but you've <laughs> obviously uh, <laughs> you've you've. Um, You've got a lot under the belt for somebody that is as, as, as young as yourself. And I know that at the age of 29, you were, you were offered a CEO position and, and you turned that down. But you, you can share with us a bit more about what, what, because you don't tell us in the book, but I'm going to ask you tonight why, why you did that. So, so brace yourself for that question. But some of your achievements is you've, you've done three major business turnarounds. Uh, you've received and were awarded two merits by the global telecoms business, uh, top 40, under 40 leader in 2011, and the top 25 global telecoms leader in 2012, together and brushing shoulders with the CEOs of Apple, Google, and, uh, and a few other. So, so Norman, you've, you've really, you've been around, um, you've got a lot of experience for somebody your age, um, and I, and I guess that's where the, the, the age old thing goes, you know, it's not about age, you know, age, age is, age is not, age is just a number. Um, but you, you've managed to, um, to, to get quite a lot under your belt in the, in the past 15 years. Um, so, so why did you then write the book? I mean, because I, I know you, you say that this book, um, is, is so that you can teach people about, about leadership. Um, but why did you write it now? Or, well, you didn't write it now. You only wrote it in 2014. Um, but why did you write it almost so early in your career? Um, just share with us, what was that pivotal moment? Uh, did you just wake up one morning and you decided to write it? Did somebody ask you? Did your, did your wife or girlfriend nag you? Uh, did you have a best friend that, that, that pushed you into writing the book? I mean, what is, what is the big reason for you to write this book, Norman? Thanks, Jacques, and uh, thank you to the listeners and viewers. I'm glad the technology worked because um, I told uh, you earlier on that technology never works when people are watching, and it didn't prove me wrong today. <laughs> so uh, we lost a good 20 minutes. My apologies to the viewers for that, but I think it saved me well because I was trying, regardless of, it was working perfectly well before, but I said, as long as we want it to work, it will fail. And today, it didn't prove me wrong. I've been in technology all my life, so it <laughs> continues to baffle me. But again, it's a great asset, all of us. I believe I've got people from the UK, the UAE, from Zambia, Nigeria, who have been asking me about this particular event. And I hope they will actually get to join so we can share. Uh, mm. I think to your question, I always say, like to say, I have paid my school fees in the continent. Uh, and, I, and some of them have been very expensive school fees, uh, moving around both Southern Africa, West Africa, North Africa, and a bit of East Africa. You, you learn a lot. And when you learn those things, sometimes you realize, you know, some of them were punctuated by great successes. Some of the successes, like what we did in Zambia, found its way to the London Business School as a case study of how to do a turnaround. For five years, they were actually lecturing that case study of Zambia. Now, I asked myself, how can I replicate some of this? And uh, the ideas didn't come from my head. 
I read a lot of books and I applied a lot of the things that I learned and I applied them into the businesses that I was working in. And I, go, I, I saw the results. And I almost repeated the same when I went to Nigeria, I saw the same results. Then I thought, hmm, maybe there is something that I can share with people. One of my values is called lifelong learning. How can I impart this value of lifelong learning? Mm -hmm. You know, I said in the book, if you want to hide money from an African, you put it in a book because we don't like to read the book. So I said, well, if you put a hundred dollars in the book, I will find it because I think there's a lot really hidden in the books. So a lot of that experience for me, I felt it will be lost if I don't repackage it and write it from a Pan-African or an African perspective. Because let's face it, the hedgehog concept came from the good to great. Exactly. But how do you apply a hedgehog concept when you're try, trying to drive a business in Nigeria where you have to deal with the tribal groups, you have to deal with the religion, you have to deal with things that they don't deal with in Silicon Valley. Only mm -hmm. in Nigeria can you deal with those things as a leader. And as a manager, I needed to almost crystallize some of these mm -hmm. concepts. Take mm -hmm. wherever I need to take them, share the actual experiences on the ground, and repackage it and repurpose it for Africans. And that's why it's from an African perspective. So someone says, but doesn't, doesn't the concept work? It works everywhere else, but then there are lots of books out there are more interested in Africa. And I so think we've got a leadership gap here. We need to close it. So Norman, what, 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 what I'm hearing you saying is that you're not saying that leadership is fundamentally different um, across the broad spectrum, but what you're really saying is there's some nuances that you have to understand to be able to navigate through the African landscape because your, 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 your background, the African background is different than any of the other continents. And if you don't get that, um, you don't understand leadership in the African context. And we all know that everything is about context. I mean, you could have theory and, and read all the books um, or from, from, from all over the world. And sure, there are, there are some, some, some um, nuggets, but you've got to apply it in the African context. And I'm, I'm very interested to unpack that with you. But before we go there, Norman, um, in, your, in your introduction of your book, you, you wrote that this book is for your, your target audience, is small businesses to massive multinationals. And I know specifically that, that your experience is a massive multinationals. But the question I have is, is why are you confident that this shoe can fit both target markets? In other words, both the small business and the multinationals. Why do you feel that your book is a fit for both shoes? You know, um, very good question, Jacques. Um, what a, a gentleman who is running a million dollar company and another gentleman, a lady who is now running a billion dollar company in Africa mm -hmm. and a president who is running a trillion dollar economy require the same set of skill set to run these things albeit at different levels of sophistication and bandwidth. But do they need to understand the importance of leadership? Absolutely. Do they need to understand the concept of managing talent? Both how do you identify good talent, motivate good talent, enhance talent, and fit that talent in your team to make it a winning team. Whether you're running a million dollar uh, SME or a billion dollar corporate or a trillion dollar country, so I, I said those leadership skills are universal. They need to be understood. Now, it's different if you're running a million dollar company in, 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 in the middle of uh, Lagos versus a million dollar company in Silicon Valley. There are different dynamics you need to understand. The way you speak to the market is different. The talent you need is different. So whether it's leadership, my book is about strategy, it's about execution, and it's about output. Those three cover all the three angles. So you will notice at the very tail end, I did go there where we all don't like to go there. How do we turn around this continent called Africa, which I felt is poorly managed, can be managed better by the same skill set that we seem to actually have in abundance in the continent, but they don't like to go all the way up to the national level because they're saying politics is too dirty. We'd rather run our billion dollar company. Then one day they're surprised 
how their billion dollar company become a slave of the president in power. And before you know it, that weakest part becomes your next strategy exercise. So for me, we can't separate that. And I said, we need to look at the small guy, the middle guy, and including even at a national level. Excellent. Excellent, Norman. So I, I, I like that. And we're definitely going to go into this African story because I think this as, as a, the, the Africa story is fascinating um, for us. And, you know, and, and being a business coach myself, I speak to many leaders and everybody wants to go into Africa. You know, everyone wants to go and do business in Africa. But the reality is, I don't think everybody knows Africa and understands it. So we're really going to um, tap your brain and, and, and your knowledge and experience in that. But before we go there, there's one more question that I have for you, and that's, you know, relating to the times we live in. Um, you know, we've got COVID-19 and, and we, we, we're not going to dive into the, the, the reality of that necessarily. But what I want to ask you is, you wrote this book in 2014. We had a different world then. I mean, in 2014, we never thought that what would happen today um, is happening. But why do you feel confident that your book is, is relevant, especially in the, in the COVID-19 environment? Why, why would your stories and your experiences, because isn't it a question that it's completely new, it's different. You know, we've almost got a, a blank canvas. We almost need to take all the leadership books that are out there and maybe pack them away and start writing new books for the new world. Um, what is your take on that? Um, I think COVID-19 presents its, um, it's a crisis. And you, we talk about, you don't waste away a good crisis. This is a crisis. But as a business, you need to ask yourself, which side of the pendulum are you going to emerge out of this? If you go into the core things that I wanted to illustrate in my book, mm. there's an issue of values in the leadership of the people. What do you need today more than anything else is a leadership team that is able to look at what is the lay of the land. How do we restructure our business? How do we redesign our business? How do we re-engineer our business to be able to survive in, in a crisis like this? Remember, this is not the only crisis we've had. We had a crisis in 2008. We've had Great Depression. We've had crisis after crisis. But the skill set needed in the leadership does not actually change so significantly. Right now, you need to almost blow up your entire business canvas and ask yourself, have you got the right product? Do you have the right route to market? How is your marketing being done? Today, if you are going to talk to me about billboards, newspapers, I'm beginning to ask you, are you still living in the old? Because I could reach a billion people using social media. So, but this is what COVID is now beginning to present for us. Did we write about that? Yes, it was there. So the leadership piece is important. But strategy, where you have got a, such chaos, you need a single-minded focus on understanding what you can do better than anyone in the world. And that's what you, what you need right now. It was relevant in 2014. It's even more relevant today. Mm. I talk about conflict in organizations and how to unlock that conflict and be able to, we say no, no say, no skill, uh, smooth seas don't make a skillful sailor. I love that one. I love it. Smooth, smooth seas don't make a skillful sailor. Yeah. COVID creates great sailors. If you can survive out of COVID, you can survive everywhere else. Now let's go back quickly. 2008 is where we saw the emergence of some of the best businesses, Airbnb, Uber, and the like. Out of this crisis, entrepreneurs should start looking for a new need, for a new niche, for a new market, and a market that could actually emerge out of this. I'm not saying business are not going to go under. This is a very serious problem. I don't think we've seen it to this magnitude. But, but are the principles still the same? Yes, they held in 2014. They're even more relevant in 2020. Yeah, I, I, I love what you're saying because, you know, when you, and I, and I love that saying, uh, smooth, smooth uh, weather doesn't, doesn't make skillful uh, sailors. Yes. Um, and this is really the opportunity to, to hone new skills and stuff like we're doing with the business book club. I mean, we would have never have learned these new skills and taking our our market online if it wasn't for COVID-19. And I guess we could have easily have gone and said, well, we'll wait until it's all over. Um, 
but we know that we've got a purpose and we know that we, we, we've got value to add because I guess that's really what it's about. You know, as long as you're adding value, people would want you. Um, but I, also, go- I could even add, I think, even from a capability building point of view, I, I have got in my own organization, my own team, our own program where we are able to reach out to some of the top talent in the world to talk to us about energy. I have got some of the top talent in the, from any corner of the world. The technology okay. and these platforms are allowing me to be able to reach to levels I could never reach before because I can literally put five to 10 of my country is a teams that are in five to say 10 countries on one platform, Zoom platform, for instance, and mm. I can get someone sitting mm. in, in London or, or Beijing or Japan to be able to talk to us about KZ, continuous improvement. They can mm. talk to us about how to reach the bottom end of the pyramid. And they can talk, I couldn't do this until now. So it's called a new normal, but they are, we say it's a perfect storm for us to recreate a new business and a new model. Absolutely. And, and Norman, I mean, with, with that said, and knowing that, that leadership is, is important in this time of crisis, um, you've had lots of practice of that in, 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 in boardroom politics. And in your, in your book, you share a lot of your stories and the fundamental of every story that I, that I, that I read about what you did um, took it down back to values, took it down back to, to what you stand for. Um, so what advice would you be able to share with our audience on, on, on values? Because, you know, sometimes I feel like values get spoken about like a commodity. Um, it gets thrown around and like, yeah, like it's a commodity and it loses its essence. So what message have you got for our, our audience in terms of values, but also giving us some examples of how you've used those values to turn around some, uh, or, to, or to navigate some big decisions that you had to make where lots of money was involved, where lots of careers were involved, big relationships, important relationships were involved. How have you used that to navigate that one could almost push parallel to, to the current crisis that we are experiencing. Fantastic. And I think value is a very, it, it's the very first chapter of the book. And I've always said to people, you know, if you are, at least if you're going to work with me or become a partner of mine, get to know what my values are, because that's what describes me. Um, I, have got, I, I, I summarize five values and it's easier for me to explain them through that. And I'll try to do it quickly. You know, for a short man, we struggle with the, a short summary, you know, it's, it's you never understand it, uh, uh, Jacques, because you are tall. So don't don't even don't even laugh because you know I become very sensitive around uh, my height. But number one, it's 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 legacy. Number two is integrity. Number two is l- three lifelong learning. Number four is work. Number five is output. Why do I say legacy? I say it to people. You know, someday I'll invite a few people to my funeral. That day will come, obviously, for all of us. I want to hear what you say at the funeral. And I want you, Jacques, to say, hey, Ella is a young man. Ah, oh, we worked with him. He was great. I would like my children to say the same. I would like my wife to say he was the greatest husband that I ever lived. Hopefully there wouldn't be another husband at that stage. I would like my employer to say, wow, he delivered great value for us. But I also want my team to be able to say he was a great leader. He allowed me to see my very best. Can you see, I have just taken care of all my major stakeholders in one value. I moved on the value of integrity. I want, I don't want to be second guessed whether I signed something and whether it was in bad test or there was anything unbecoming of it. I've worked in Nigeria. I had a hundred million dollar budget every year for three years running. That's $300 million budget. And there are a few things you should not put in the same concoction a hundred million dollar budget and the chief marketing officer role together don't go very well together. I won't say in Nigeria, but it's even worse because you get a lot of creativity beginning to emerge. People wanting to uh, game you in this. And as a marketing, as a chief marketing officer, you've got too much power to abuse because I could decide to say, you know, this particular proposition, I'm going to push it on billboards because I've got a side deal that I've done with a billboard company. In Africa, it's tough when you've got that. But I had to 
and explain this value to my entire team and to all my partners across the board. And one of the most rewarding conversation is when a partner walked into my office and he said, Oga, uh, we are here, you are the new Oga now, you don't shop. So we're quite happy doing business with you. And they, they were basically just saying, oh, the market is, is talking that uh, the new boss doesn't take much. So doesn't take anything. So it's, it's not worth us trying to be funny. Let's just stick to the, to, the, to the work that we need to do. That's how the integrity value saved me. And so I'm able to do the work and the teams around me are comfortable that I'll always back them because of that integrity value. The lifelong learning, very important. I said, across the businesses, I learned a lot of concepts and I applied them. When I think a concept is great, I will apply it. One of the mm. things you notice in my long learn, lifelong learning, I like to call it triple L because it triples my, my tongue. The triple L. The triple L <laughs> is, is the reason why I had to write the book because I needed to share. But the triple L is why I try to read two books every week. And you'll be surprised. It's very easy with Audible these days. You drive in the traffic on the way to the office, one chapter. On the way back, another chapter. By the end of, by Wednesday, I'm done with two books. And I can repeat over and over. And every time I learn some of these books, I put them into practice. So I think work is one of those values and profit. But work is about working smart, execution, follow through, follow through, follow through. Very important. You know, it's not so much about spending 16 hours in the office. It's what you do with the four or five hours that you spend is the focus. And in times like this, if you are going to sit there and be very proud of spending 16 hours and another guy is working smarter, you're going to do a lot more work and get a lot less done. Smart partnering matters in these times like this. That's the work ethic. That's the execution value. Results are stubborn. I always say numbers are stubborn. Numbers don't lie unless you work for Enron, but numbers don't lie generally. So I focus on the numbers. I focus on the output. In times like this, you want to focus on the output. To be spending a lot of time, I say there's no return on ego in business. Focus mm. on return on the investment. Focus mm. on the return on equity. I would even end and say the values have taught me that I always, if, ever since for the past 15 years, I always drive a big car. It is a big Land Cruiser. Even if I can't afford it, I'll buy a second-hand one. Why? Because I need to pack my ego in the boot of that car. I cannot bring it into a meeting. Because when I bring it into a meeting, I then start making the wrong decisions that will destroy me. All those decisions are guided by my values. Fascinating. Um, and, I, and I like that story about the numbers. Um, because you, you're talking like a true accountant and being, uh, you know, from an accounting background, when you talk about numbers, um, I can totally relate to that. And I always share with my clients that the numbers tell you the story. So you, they don't lie. Um, and, I, and, I, and I know, you know, people always say, if you, if you want to know where things just follow the money, you know, follow the, follow, follow the numbers and they'll tell you, tell you what, what has happened. And for um, me, Jack, I connect the numbers to the legacy. So I say this legacy is number one. When you don't deliver those numbers, there's no legacy to leave behind. When you worked for Enron, what you do is you remove Enron on your CV. When you worked for Lehman Brothers, you have to remove it off your CV because there is no numbers to show for it and so does your legacy. So, so for me, the two are so interconnected. And mm -hmm. I then always say, is I, I can't be the only guy in the room who has got the best idea because I will not leave a legacy if I do that. I have to cultivate ideas from each and every member of my team. And recently mm -hmm. we found out that, you know, team members are different. You know, Ronaldo is a diva. Uh, sorry to the, um, is it, the, the supporters. Can be a diva in a team. <laughs> he needs to acclimatize as a leader to accommodate yeah. Ronaldo or else you never win the, the, the tournaments. If you want to treat him the same way you treat any midfielder, you will never get anywhere. Every team member is unique. And I've had to accept that. And I've had to bend over and bow down to certain team members because I realize how valuable they are, but they also like to be treated differently. That's what the values teach me on meticulous, I think very important information to that level of detail yeah and i think i think one of your one one, one of the values that you also shared is, is higher ground you know where you sometimes you you stay on higher ground and i and i love the analogy that you use the war analogy 
uh, from one of the books that you've read. And by the way, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that afterwards we'll share a link uh, to, to um, uh, Norman's book that you can purchase on, on Amazon. And, 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 and what COVID has actually done is I'm quite a tactile guy. So I, I like books and, we, and you know, we've got a big library. And for the first time I, had to, I was pushed because I had to read Norman's book <laughs> for this interview. So I had to go onto a, a Kindle and read it. Uh, and I actually, it was, it was a breeze and I actually loved it. Um, but at the end, I think it's right, like right at the end, Norman has got a very, very nice reference of books. Um, and I've, I've actually gotten most of them already under, on my next reading list. Um, and in there, you talk about the, the, the art of war and the higher ground. Okay, so, so, so just to bring us back to the conversation. And the higher ground is sometimes the place that you've got to take where you don't take sides, Norman. And, and, I, and I think that can sometimes be extremely difficult. Um, please, please share with us your experience of not taking sides. Um, I think one, there is a concept of, um, I think someone said to me, uh, people run away from their managers. People never leave organizations, not only, yeah, sometimes they do leave because the money is good on the other side, but mostly people are driven out of organizations because they're not happy with their, their managers, particularly their line managers or people, a few people on top of them. And so we, we always chase away people. But one of the skills that I had to learn very in a harsh way was that um, I couldn't, when I left Zimbabwe, I was very unhappy with one or two managers who made me very uncomfortable. And at the time I left, I was celebrated. I don't have to deal with this person all my life. Yeah, mm. her name was Sarah. This is just another name. Her name was Sarah. I said, I don't have to deal with Sarah all my life. I'm so happy I'm moving to Zambia. So I moved to Zambia. And within three months, Paul emerged. And he hated my guts. He hated that I was short and I talked too loud. And every strategy that I put, he set on a tangent to destroy it. Then I thought, this is funny. This is the same behavior emerging. Now, I'm not going to leave this place anytime soon. So I have to learn the art of dealing with people like this instead of trying to find a way out. Now, in most unfortunately situation in organization, internal politics can be the toughest thing to deal with. It's, it's actually so underrated because you hear people talking politics, I don't like my manager, is this. I said, you don't have a lot of options to say, oh, because I'm not getting along with Shaq, I'm leaving this organization. Because guess mm. what? The next company, just get there, give yourself three more months, the next Jacques will appear. And they normally mutate. They even become worse. So by the time I moved out of Zambia, I had to deal with my demons, those people that just are difficult for me to deal with. And then I learned something from that. Say, you know what? I need to learn to always stay on higher ground. My integrity value should always protect me to be able to stay on higher ground. But there will always be internal conflict in organizations. I need to always, and it's not the easy part, but I need to always take the higher ground. This says when two elephants fight, the grass suffers on the ground. That is a fact. But when those two elephants fight, unfortunately in Nigeria in particular, I had them and they were as big as elephants. These were two big senior executives at each other's logger. I had a case study there. I get called 4 p.m. on a Saturday. I'm playing golf, come to the office, there's a meeting. And I'm sitting there and they went head on and we needed to take sides. And everyone had to take sides. I said, but why do I have to take sides? I think there is a good conversation to have here. Let's have it. There was no room for that. <laughs> and I was told, you are, I was given words. You are a wimp. You don't have a backbone. You are this, you are that. So I took it like a man. And I went, I cried on my own. Then by 8 p.m. of the same day, one of the belligerents called me. And he says, we th well, thank you, Norman, for your professionalism in that conversation. And we are, I'm sorry that we put you in a place where you were very uncomfortable. And I swear to you, barely 30 minutes later, the other belligerent called me and also apologized. Then I asked myself, I doubt they called the other guys who took sides. But I even I said, what was even worse was there was a losing party to that debate, right? Even in terms of votes, numbers. Mm -hmm. Guess who ended up winning the debate? was the losing part. We all had to work under that losing executive. So you can imagine how complex that relationship can be. And in some cases, 
then you have to leave. Most people have to leave the organization because you've failed. So for me, it said internal politics, you've got to master the art of working in organizations. You can never run away from politics. In fact, I said, take your wife, you and your wife, you're mm. fairly safe. Bring in a baby until they get to six years. By the time they're seven years, they already mastered the art of politics. They know how to play mom and dad. <laughs> bring, bring in another one, or by the time he gets to 10, 15, that's a political company. It's worse than ANC versus uh, EFF because there's enough politics going in there. Emotional intelligence is key in environments like that. And there's yeah. not something you pick on the streets. You've got to learn it. And I wanted to actually share that concept of emotional intelligence and how to survive and thrive in tense environments. And Nigeria put me in the center stage of that. I had to deal with the religion, with the tribe. I also had to deal with ageism and sexism. People were very unhappy that I was an executive at 33 and I was short and loud. And that doesn't work very well sometimes. Hmm. But you're leading us into the next conversation. But before we go there, because I think it's time that we start talking about Africa and the African continent and how to do business there. But before we do that, Norman, I just want to reach out to our audience um, and just let them know that they must, they must feel free to ask questions or to engage with us. You know, we've got the ability to see their questions, we've got the ability to, to answer them. And, and Norman <laughs> would love to answer your questions. If there's anything that you want to know about Africa um, or about his, his, his current role at Econet or about his uh, experience in the, in the African environment and the telecoms environment, or also his opinion on COVID, please feel free to, to post your questions um, and we'll answer them as, as, as soon as we start seeing them come through and as soon as there's a gap in our conversation. So, so Norman, let's go, let's go back to Africa and let's go back to, to, um, to this situation that you were in where you know, you're in Nigeria, um, there's something like, I, what did you say? There's like a, 137 tribes there? Yes, yes. I mean, you know, we think we have problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they, they do have 150 million people. We, we've got 50 million people uh, or 60 million. But 137 tribes, that, that, makes, that makes a big difference. Um, but how do, you, how do you navigate that? Especially, you know, because in, in one of your comments, um, and, and it's also... Um, um, quite well known is where you say you've got you need you need no local knowledge so here you are um and I, I mean before before you went to nigeria you worked in um botswana or south africa or did you work in, in zambia. Zimbabwe? zambia so you were working in zambia so so from zambia going to nigeria you weren't a local boy uh you weren't one of the tribes um, which is which is actually contradictory to what people say. You know, you've got to be a local to be able to operate there. So, but you were successful, and and the reason you were successful is because you were able to put a lot of pressure on MTN at that stage. Am I right? Because you were taking yeah. a lot of their customers away, and I mean, there's a reason why you won those awards. Um, yeah. So, so how did you do? How did you do that? Somebody that's not a local. Um, Who's, who's got a fierce competitor with a lot of money and been operating there for a while, how did you do it? So I think, and we should define, define success correctly because I like to, I said it's about numbers. So I moved into the market, we had 5 million customers. By the time, 36 months later, we were 20 million customers. We moved in the market, we were making $500 million turnover. 36 months, we were making $2 billion. Now. I take a lot of that uh, part of that success with the leadership team because I, I had the responsibility of driving customer numbers and driving revenue. Now, we obviously had the rest of the team to deliver the product and everything else. But as a team, we were successful. Personally, in particular, I had to accept first and foremost that when you get into a place, you know, we call it in the book, I talk about the thicket fence syndrome. A man was going into East Africa. He arrived into a village in East Africa, Kenya. It was a village. He, as he's walking into the village, he sees a small little thicket fence in the middle of a village. And he says, but what is this thicket fence for? It didn't make sense to him. He kicked it off, continued doing his journey into the village. So he, had, he was taking photography. 
Mm-hmm. Then two days later, villages, he sees villages scampering, screaming, crying. And he says, what's going on? He says, some idiot removed the fence that we had put against the lion and the lion is now in the village and is busy attacking the villagers. He says, but I saw it, but I thought it was just, it didn't save papers. He says, well, you see, the lion always used to come on the same route, get to the thicket fence, then it will turn and go back. But because you removed it without asking the question, if you had just asked us, we would have told you why we put that thicket fence there. Now, that is, it's a, it's a learning. As I was moving into Nigeria, I was very nervous. I've never been that nervous. My wife was even more livid to say, wow, how are you going to survive in that market? This is not Zambia, no man. Listen, Zambia had barely 1 million customers. I was moving to a network with 5 million, starting at 5 million, moving from a 1 million network customer. So you can do all sorts of numbers there. But the ticket fence syndrome taught me when I got there, the first 90 days, I needed to understand why is that ticket fence there? Why do we have 93% of management being one tribe? 93% of management. Mm. Where is the rest of the other 140 tribes? Why is it that this particular gentleman in my team, every idea he comes up with is superior, cannot be challenged? Uh, Then they told me, Oga, because he's an Igbo man, and they are supposed to be the smart ones. In in Tanzania, they are called chagas. So even if the idea is dumb, but because it came from a particular tribal background, Mm. no one is willing to challenge it. Now, you had to understand, because I sat in one meeting where the two of my senior execs were fighting it out. And I couldn't understand because it was so obvious to me that one was had a much stronger proposition than the other. But guess what? The other one nearly won until I had to override it. And I was called on the side, says, oh, guy, you've just done something very unusual. You know, this particular gentleman in this company, he's one who comes up with all the ideas. I said, but his idea is not correct. He says, yeah, it doesn't matter, Oga, but he's Igbo. So it's what it is, accept it. I said, well, then we have got a problem. How do we work things out? But I had to humble myself to learn. I had to apply the thicket fence syndrome to learn. My first ever pitch to the executive team was trashed, completely trashed. And I couldn't understand. Then we called in McKinsey and company. I gave them the same dossier that I presented to the executive team on the strategy. They took two weeks. You know what you do with the consultants, nothing personal, but they'll take your watch and then they'll tell you what time it is. So they took my dossier, they cleaned it up. They did a brilliant job. When they showed me, it it looked even different to me and they presented it and it was approved. Then I was concerned, what exactly happened? Because it's the same dossier. Then they said, did you go to the CEO's house? I said, to do what? He says, you have to walk the CEO through your story first. I said, I can't do that. That to me sounds like I'm bribing the CEO. He should come to the executive meeting and I'll present my story there. He said, no, guy, it doesn't work like that. If you present it in front of the CEO, in front of the other executives, you are a marketer, you talk in lingo, you put abbreviations. How is he going to ask you what, what does Toma means, top of mind awareness? In an executive meeting and he's the CEO, he's supposed to know that. Now, because he doesn't know that, you have just put him in a corner where he's going to trash what you have just done because you didn't walk him in his comfort. Then I thought, oh, the light came on. Now I understood. So I spent the 90 days learning. But after I got what I needed to get, I moved into the execution. I love that story. I love that. I mean, that's, yeah. So so, so it's really as... And I mean, you, you, that's a thread in your book as well. It's about execution. Um, it's, the, it's the little secret that, that has helped you take things to the next level in your, in your career. And Norman, I see, I see that there's a, there's a comment here from one of our, our um, audience members, uh, Steady Shumba. Um, and what's your answer to that? I mean, where, where he's saying that line management is usually the number one challenge in every organization. I mean... How does one deal with it when you're getting blocked, when your ideas are getting blocked, when, when, you, when you can almost see um, the answer and, and line management is just blocking you? What do you, what do you say to somebody? What, what advice do you give to somebody like, like uh, Steady Shumba? I think number one is, I think he's spot on. I said earlier on is people run away from people. 
And unfortunately, most people run away from their line managers. And I think the, while it's a lot of material, books, CEOs, talk about the importance of people and talent in organizations. But if you actually get to the, when the rubber hits the road, you'll be amazed at the amount of lip service they offer to this concept of developing talent. It, you'll be amazed at the lip service. So I say, you know, no stream can ever rise above its source. So if your line manager is this level, he will struggle to create a team that can be this level. The team can only start at the level of the line manager and below. And I can tell you when you've got great talent, a mm. poor line manager does not appreciate that. In fact, sometimes they even feel threatened. Mm. So a line manager dictates so much about the character and the DNA of an organization more than anything else. A CEO's role is to really build the right caliber of line managers. First and foremost, what kind of line manager should it be? In the book, I talk about Fords and Ferraris. I said in every one of every organization, there are Fords and there are Ferraris. In every one of us as a, as a people, you need to know who you are. Are you a Ferrari or are you a Ford? No, forget about the Ford. Call it a Land Cruiser. You know, the four-wheel Land Cruiser, the one you take into the village. You know you're going to go there and you will return back in one piece. If you're going to jump into a Ferrari and try to go into the village in Africa with a, land, with a Ferrari, I don't think you know what you, you, you're not wired straight. But you need to, a, a manager, line managers who don't first know who they are, are a problem. You see, if I'm in marketing, I need a bunch of very creative people in marketing. I need a bunch of very people who love the next big challenge. And that, those are mostly your Ferraris. In finance, operations, processing, I need solid land cruisers. Mm. I need solid Fords. You know, when I say Ford, it's not the one that is bending. There's the other one that always catches fire. I'm talking about the American Ford with four wheels and the like. Big one. Yes. Now, first and foremost, line managers, if a line manager doesn't know who he is, he's likely going to either recruit a bunch of Ferraris and you frustrate them out of a job. Or he's going to be putting the wrong people into the wrong wrong roles. He's going to be promoting. I, I saw something recently that's the worst thing a manager can do is to promote an underperformer. In the book, I said, in every team, there are A performers, B performers, and C performers. Your A are your star performers. You should pamper them. You spend mm -hmm. time with them. And don't feel guilty to spend a lot of time with them. Then there are B performers. This is the bedrock of your organization. Reward them. Empower them you know, motivate them and do all sorts of training to them. Mm. But then they are C performers. Get rid of them. Do yourself a favor. A line manager who fails to deal with his C performers sends a good signal to the rest of the organization that I value C performers. And you know what you do when you do that? You chase away all the A performers. So that's why the line management comment is spot on. That's, the, that's one of the biggest challenges we have in organizations. We have it all the way up to the national level. <clears throat> where you've got ministers, you've got presidents in countries that I cannot entrust with a million dollar company. If you are a president of my country and I cannot trust you with to run a one million dollar, a small little pop and shop, seriously, how do you run a trillion dollar economy? I say insanity is doing such and expect a different result. The same thing over and over, expecting different results. Norman, thank you so much for your insights. And uh, I've got, we're going to have time for two more questions before we wrap it up for this evening. We want to thank everybody that's online. And if there's any more questions, please, uh, please put them through. Um, Norman, then there's, a, there's another one that I want to um, bring to your attention. Um, and it's a, it's a quote from your book where it says, um, where you, where, where you talk about Africa is an evil place to live. And then you end the quote with, because of people don't doing any, or, or, or don't do anything about it. You know, so people turning their backs. Um, and, and, and that's almost like the African story. Why, and why is it happening? And, and, and what can we do to change the narrative? And a said a sad one for that matter. Africa is bad because not because we lack talent, 
not because we lack resources, we are very rich with the resources, not because of any of that. I say the problem of Africa is a leadership problem, both at a national level, but also at a corporate and at, 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 at a small scale level. Not because we also don't have the leaders, but I think we inherited a challenge and instead of trying to find a certain mindset that can change it, we have continued to dig a hole. In the chapter, you see me say the first law of holes. When you fall into a hole, stop digging. We fell into a hole as a continent. We now need to get, dig ourselves out of a hole. Unfortunately, my biggest call is to people that, I think you will notice that I am aware that when President Obama was in the White House, he had a number of Africans actually advising him. Some of them actually my own countrymen Zimbabweans advising people like President Obama when he was president. When I spoke to some politicians in Zimbabwe, they'd never heard, heard of those names. So I said, how? You, are, you, you have never heard of a Zimbabwean advising the US president. You've never reached out to him. How many capable people can run the continent right now? There is a lot of A-star candidates for presidents in Africa. Most of them would not touch politics because the place is congested and the place is adulterated. We need mm -hmm. to clear, create a way out of it. We will not be able to get above the quality of the leadership we have. Now, we've got a few exceptional cases where we have seen the leadership beginning to rise and the countries beginning to follow. And that's why I say is no, is, no, no stream can rise above its source. Mm -hmm. A country cannot be more superior than its president or its, 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 its political leadership. We don't like politics. Neither am I encouraging, but I'm saying, sorry, you can diss it all you want. Your next strategy conversation, your next boardroom conversation is going to be about those decisions that are made. I would like to see finance ministers who understand finance. I would like to see telecom ministers who understand technology. I would like to see the chief legal or justice ministers who understand the basic law. I would like a president that I can entrust with a million dollar company. But let's move away from there. I'm also talking about young entrepreneurs in the continent. There is a lot of potential in this continent to bring new young entrepreneurs. I lecture at Stellenbosch Business School, as you know, and one of the most co consistent questions that comes in when I talk about Africa is, but there's no money, no man. How do we become entrepreneurs if there's no access to money? And I say, I always answer the same way. Resources follow strategy. Have you actually got a strategy? Now they say, yeah. But I have to be white, I have to come from this tribe, I have to come from this, I have to be this, I have to be BE compliant. No. I'm sorry, whether you're white, black, Indian, colored, if you don't have a bankable story, even if you come to me as your cousin, I will not give you $100. Now, I try to encourage the continent, especially the young talent in the continent, mm -hmm. to say, let's start looking at reimagining how we build the continent of Africa by creating jobs. And I, I don't go too far. Why don't you start doing goats? Because I do experiment with these things. I start a goat business. And I actually made tremendous money doing goats. I bought goats for $500. By the time I finished, I was sitting at $1,500 in a space of nine months. Now, let me also tell you a story. Airbnb borrowed $500 from their mother to build the first website. They are now in 80 billion, only in 2008. They didn't have a rich cousin. They didn't have a rich brother. They were not a Dangote. So mm. as a continent, we now need to find ways to build an entrepreneurial culture from the grassroots on upwards. In fact, some of the beauty of COVID is we as a continent are not as interlinked to the global economy as maybe countries like South, South Africa. So you will find out that we might actually still be able to emerge and rebuild our SME economies if we can cultivate a culture of entrepreneurship. Now, if I collect with the political leadership, there are certain countries in Africa that have started embracing it. Places like Rwanda, we're setting up a companies one day. Botswana is coming on board, Kenya is beginning to come on board, South Africa is beginning. Now we need to connect these two and start harnessing the bottom end of the pyramid and create entrepreneurial people and bring them up. Please don't worry, money is not your biggest problem. 
it's more like the idea that is lacking. If you have got an idea, visit your friends first. There's something called crowdfunding now. If you can't sell your idea to your family, don't try to sell it to a bank because they won't buy it. Oh, I love I love that advice. That's 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 very very applicable to to this conversation. Thank you for that, Norman. Norman, we've got time for a last question. Uh, I see there a question from Terence. So so Terence's question is: Norman, considering your book is about leadership from an African perspective, what is your advice on doing away with the mediocrity mentality, saying uh, or the excuse of this is Africa? How? What, what advice have you got for Terence on that? This you know, is it's, I think it's a, it's a very uphill task. My first advice to Terence is the only way we can really show a story is to showcase some of our success stories. I obviously, because I like to read a lot, I have gone through the story of Dangote in and out, more Ibrahim in and out, obviously my own boss in and out. I have gone through a lot of stories, including the Rockefeller, the Rothschild. I've, and there is one pattern that I see across all those people. It has never been an attitude. Uh, it's, it's an attitude of a can-do attitude. It's the frame of mind that each of them had. I even had to go to Cecil John Roth to just trying to figure out how did some of these things like DPS come up? There's nothing unique that I've seen in all that. It was, it was in Africa that they came and they became one of some of the richest people. What was Dangote doing when he started? What business was he doing? The problem is we like to copy. We like to see what they do in China and we come here and we want to replicate. Sorry, if they're doing in China, they've got enough capacity, you can never beat them. In the book, I talk about the hedge war concept. I said, you have got to do something that only you can be the only one who can do it better than anyone in the world. Guess what? I like sweet potatoes. And I like particularly sweet potatoes from Zimbabwe. And let me also tell you a fact. There is no other sweet potato in the world that tastes the same way as the one you find in Zimbabwe. And I, I had a rude awakening one day in Dubai. At my daughter's 10th birthday, I'm sitting with my family and I ordered, and it was written Zimbabwean sweet potato. I bought it. First and foremost, the bill when it came, my bill alone was more than the other three uh, family members because of that word Zimbabwean sweet potato. But when I finished eating it, I did not regret because the taste, the palate was so different. The taste was so different. Then I say to myself, why would that be the case? Then I found out you cannot grow that sweet potato anywhere else except in a soil somewhere in a village in Zimbabwe or somewhere in a town in Zimbabwe. That's a very unique proposition. None, none of us today with these on-demand platforms, today in the on-demand platforms, nothing stops us from being able to build different concepts out of Africa. So to, it, this is not Africa anymore. It's a mindset and the battle is in the mind. Excellent, Norman, can, can, can you do one more quick question? I think it follows on very well on what you're saying now. And I'm almost not going to give you an opportunity to answer me because if I ask you the question, and uh, then, you, then you have to answer it. But a quick one, where would you focus? I mean, if, if, if Norman had a blank canvas, where would you focus to start a business in the post-corona world? Uh, and where do you see uh, the opportunities for entrepreneurs in, in this post-corona world? And this is, a, this is a, a question from Jan. Very good question. And I'll try. Yeah. And I'm giving trade secrets. I shouldn't give trade secrets. But number one, you know, I was reading about a company called LHG in the USA that, and I'll give you free, free advice. Because remember, it's never in the strategy. I can share all my strategies. It's in the execution. Absolutely. So what, there is an opportunity today. People are scared to go to hospitals. I can tell you for a fact. You can build an app today, which will cost you two to $300 to build an app. You can conglomerate in any African country a number of nurses, put them on an app, and let them service people who are scared to go to hospitals. You will make money, make no mistake. The food industry will continue to be under threat, particularly with the organic people who are looking for healthy foods. Because all this idea of GMO is beginning to come to reality. People are scared of these innumerable diseases out there, and some of them coming from what you eat. They say you are what you eat. So mm. you can't, don't underestimate the food industry, but also don't underestimate the fact that we cannot be eating Mexican chickens anymore. 
So why don't you start a chicken business? All you need is a hundred dollars. Yeah, you do need a hundred dollars, but there are very few people on this call or that I know that cannot raise a hundred dollars and start from there. Now, there is also an opportunity in the mineral space. Remember the rest of the world is moving towards electric vehicles. That's a fact now, it's a given. What can you unlock from that opportunity? Energy is a crisis. What can you unlock from that opportunity? You have to look for a real need. If you are not, pro listen, I, let me finish this way. If you try to do vitamins as a product, you will only get a vitamin kind of off-tech. If you do painkillers, what do you call it, Panadol, where there's a real pain point, you will get traction. So be careful not to chase vitamins. Be careful to focus on Panadols. Because in Panadol is where you, because I have pain today, I need jobs. I'm scared to go to the hospital. I need quality food. Because part of the problem of COVID has shown how weak our health systems are. Mm. Diabetes mm. is reversible. Don't quote me because they will get me into trouble. You can manage your blood pressure. You can manage with food. So those are pa pain points people have. So if you are looking for an opportunity out of COVID, look for pain points or look for Panadol business. The business that really cures a pain. Not so much a nice to have, which is vitamin. You forget to have Jacques to drink your vitamin every now and then. Although you know maybe it is good, but you would forget. But trust me, you won't forget your painkiller. So I think that is a best way to summarize it. Norman, you've, you've absolutely left the best for last. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for our audience for asking all these questions and engaging with us. Norman, thank you for your time uh, that, that you've invested here with a book club and, and with, our, with our audience and, and, and in sharing leadership from an African perspective. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Norman's book is available um, at uh, Amazon. Uh, you can buy it on a Kindle. And, and interesting enough, if you're French, it's also available in French for those of you who, who enjoy the, the French language. Um, if you're part of our database, you will receive a link after tonight um, where we will share the link to, to buying the book. If you're not on our database, please go to our website, www.thebusinessbookclub.org uh, and register there to become a part of our community, to become part of our database uh, so that you can receive our links and that you can also receive uh, the links to our next author. We are going to run these events on a monthly basis um where we'll be interviewing uh, our, our local authors uh where they will share knowledge with you but norman once again thank you so much um you know i wish i had a big audience behind me i'm going to still figure out how to do the sound on this but i'm going to give you a big round of applause uh, just, to, just to thank you um because i know this this takes a lot of your time this takes a lot of um family time but i also know that you are passionate about sharing knowledge and sharing knowledge about the African continent, which you have got so much great experience uh, with. So thank you, thank you very much for that. Thank you, Jacques, uh, it's been a pleasure indeed. Yeah, it was lovely spending time together. And ladies and gentlemen, until next time, um, we'll be back. We'll figure out our technical issues and we'll be back with a vengeance and asking some more questions and sharing the knowledge and sharing the love. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have a great evening. And remember, keep a positive attitude um, that, that you are in charge of your destiny and that um, looking after your health um, is a very, very important part in making great decisions, as, as Norman has just shared with us here in the end. Thank and so, so the next business, Jacques, to invest in is yours because you are the next biggest thing. So go on the stock market, then we can come and buy you. I love that idea. Thank you, Norman. We're going tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everybody. Have a great Thank evening. You Thank you so much for joining us. Good night. Thank you. Good night.